today. We are living through an era of unprecedented inequality, a highly polarized authoritarian world, mechanized murder, consumerism, and I believe strongly that many of these things boil down to a system based on usury. And usury comes from fiat money. So is that kind of the fundamental problem with fiat currency, is that it's debt-based? The problem is the bank has the right to create money from nothing. The reality is we're just trying to fool God. Where does your introduction to Bitcoin fit into this story? We've got this whole Islamic financing completely wrong. And actually, the most Islamic form of money has already been invented. You can't just suddenly magic it out of nothing. So it's not magic internet money. The real magic money is fiat money. You almost should default to following the ancient wisdom because it was distilled from many lifetimes of experience. And you've had but one. And that's why I think Bitcoin is inherently Islamic, because it encourages that deferred gratification, investing in our afterlife mindset. And that's a very Islamic thing. That's a very Christian thing. So I'm extremely optimistic about the future. We can fix a broken economy. I think it's possible with the generation that's coming up. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Have you ever wanted to start a business in the Bitcoin space? If so, then the Wolf Startup Accelerator could be for you. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to businesses developing in the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times each year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. Go to wolfnyc.com to learn more or apply today. Again, that's wolf, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. Aro Serfan, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thank you very much, Robert. It's very nice to have you. Uh, Just by way of quick introduction, you are the author of a book, Heaven's Bankers. You're also the CEO of a financial technology firm, CCM. Um, And you have appeared recently in the upcoming God Bless Bitcoin documentary, where I believe you talk about uh, your perspective on Bitcoin from an Islamic finance perspective, which is what we'll be going into today. Um, I appreciate you doing this. It's been kind of a long time coming. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yes. And you're coming to us from London today. Is that correct? Correct. So maybe let's just start with something general. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got on the professional path that you are on, and how you got introduced to Bitcoin, and then and how did you become involved with this documentary? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess when I was young, I wanted to be a scientist, and I studied physics at university. Uh, and um, I uh, realized that I wasn't going to be a great physicist. And so I chose to work in the city of London instead. Uh, And at first I worked in a management consulting firm 
and I moved across to something called project finance in an investment bank. And project finance was a part of finance that I thought was somewhat more noble than other areas of finance because as a Muslim, um, I was very concerned not to work in an area, in an industry that I felt could be unethical in some way. Uh, but the finance industry seemed interesting. And within that, project finance seemed something that was worthy in some way because it financed infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So real things that people use in railways, roads, hospitals, schools, etc. And I thought that's interesting. And also it was somewhat intellectually stretching. So that was my uh, early career. I worked for a small British merchant bank, and then for Deutsche Bank uh, in London. And Deutsche Bank then moved me to Dubai. They said, we want to open an office out there and originate all of our general corporate finance business. Will you go out there? And it was a fantastic opportunity for somebody who was young, uh, relatively early stage banker. Um, You know, I was uh, the first person on the ground that they placed in our new Dubai office, had the entire place to myself, and, um, you know, it was very much frontiers banking. Uh, so there I was, uh, you know, trying to originate these big corporate finance deals uh, in a region that was, you know, uncharted territory for most of the big investment banks. And suddenly this client started coming to us and saying, well, we're very happy to have you here, uh, but we'd like to do these deals on a Sharia compliant basis, Sharia being Islamic law. Now, of course, we knew nothing about this. And, um, you know, we said, okay, we'll, we'll look into it. And we hired an individual who was uh, reputed to be the grandfather of the modern Islamic finance industry. He was a theologian, a scholar called Dr. Hussein Hamid Hassan. He was a comparative lawyer by trade and uh, very well versed not only in the intricacies of the jurisprudence of Islamic law as it pertains to commercial transactions, but also, you know, modern finance and economics. And this is a pretty unique combination. It's not something that exists very uh, readily or very widely in the world. So we learned at his feet. We were his disciples, if you like. Uh, and actually, it turned out that he had never previously before interacted with people uh, uh, like us. You know, we were Western-trained, uh, bulge bracket investment bankers, trying to do big billion-dollar cross-border transactions. And he had been used to a much more parochial style of business. You know, he'd work with somewhat sleepier uh, local domestic regional banks, uh, working in the Islamic finance space, but doing pretty basic stuff. So the Islamic finance industry had never previously had these, you know, young Turks, so to speak, from institutions like Deutsche Bank coming along and saying, yeah, structured investment products, no problem. We know how to build those. You know, cross-border acquisition financing, no problem, we can build that. And he now had this interaction with, you know, these young guys, uh, as I say, Western trained, Western educated, who came from a culture of questioning everything from first principles. And, you know, we tried to create financial product, very sophisticated financial product that had previously never been offered to a world population of 2 billion people. But now we were able to capable of creating it because what we'd done is we'd put uh, a very entrepreneurial and creative group of people on it. People who solved problems for a living. Investment banking is one of those few areas, uh, one of those few industries where cleverness is is rewarded. Just sheer intellectual cleverness and being able to solve puzzles itself is a way of of, uh, earning profit. So we were effectively solving uh, for Islamic economics, plus tax, plus legal systems, and so on and so on, and creating this very sophisticated financial product. So that was my introduction to Islamic finance, and Deutsche Bank was a pioneer in that space. Uh, I mean, certainly it was the most profitable team. We effectively invented a number of new markets in Islamic finance, and we had essentially 100% market share for a couple of years before the competition caught up. And I spent uh, 11 years in the region and then came back to the UK. I'd had a stint as the global head of Islamic finance at Barclays after Deutsche Bank. And when I came back, I worked for a boutique. And for the last seven years or so, I have been uh, consulting for the industry and have set up in the last couple of years uh, what I think is, or I hope is, the next wave of 
the Islamic finance revolution, which is to create a uh, a type of company that um, uh, finances the real economy, revolutionizes the financing in the real economy through a risk sharing, a profit participating, income generating financial instrument that is listed and liquid. So that I think is the next holy grail, so to speak. I'm mixing my metaphors there. But it's it, that I think is the next ch- stage of the Islamic finance evolution. Uh, previously, I think there had been a, a much greater emphasis on replicating the conventional debt-based financial system. But I think it's very important that we revert to the roots of Islamic finance. And, and those roots are actually common to the great monotheistic religions. They're common across many different uh, uh, world religions, uh, and they're based on the principles of, of ethical dealing with one's fellow man and woman. So I think those ethical principles have been lost somewhere along the way. Islamic finance has essentially become a kind of zombified uh, duplication of the conventional finance system. And one of the major reasons for that, in my view, is because it is still predicated on Shia money. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Uh, what? Where does your introduction to Bitcoin fit into this story? So I I do a series of lectures uh, to you know, various community groups and university students and so on, and those lectures are essentially a sort of um, version of my book. Uh, I talk about the history of Islamic finance. I talk, talk about I, I talk about what it is and what it could be. Uh, and how it could align across humanity, not just for Muslims. And uh, one day I was delivering this lecture uh, to a group of people. It was 2017, and somebody in the Q&A uh, session, somebody asked me the question, uh, what do you think about Bitcoin? And I said, no, I don't really know. Very, it's kind of magic internet money, right? And he says, no, 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 this is how it works. It's, uh, you know, it's decentralized, which means such and such and such. It's divisible, it's finite, it's scarce, it's fungible, it's et cetera, et cetera. And as he's talking, I'm thinking, wait, uh, this sounds a bit like gold. Is it like gold? He says, yeah, it basically it's gold, it's digital gold. I said, well, that's fascinating because for 700 years, the, Islam, the so-called Islamic golden age existed on a gold standard. Mm-hmm. And that was a time of great sort of scientific and mathematical and cultural advances. Uh, whilst Europe was, you know, struggling, frankly. Uh, in fact, there's a, a very interesting book uh, by someone I'm, I'm sure you know, Alan Farrington. He wrote it with Sasha Myers mm-hmm. called Bitcoin is Venice. Mm-hmm. And I tell him, you know, Alan, you should call this book Bitcoin is Baghdad, Jerusalem, and Cordoba, because that's actually where this stuff originated from before it came to Venice. So there was a period of 700 years that... Uh, the that Islamic the Islamic Empire, so to speak, existed on a gold standard, and it was, as I say, a period of, of great enlightenment, uh, scientific advancement. And what I found fascinating then was that this person in the audience was describing to me a form of gold, but a gold as we know today, of course, is impractical and manipulated and centralized, and it has so many things that that mean it can no longer be a true form of sound money. And here he was describing. So I went away and researched. I, I, I said to him, I, look, I don't know how to answer your question, but it really sounds fascinating. So I'm now going to have to go and research this thing. And I've been researching it for the last uh, seven years. And you know, the more time I spend with it, the more I realize that we've got this whole Islamic financing completely wrong. And actually, the most Islamic form of money has already been invented. Mm. And you know, whoever you know, Satoshi Nakamoto is. Probably, maybe it's one person, maybe it's a group of people, I don't know, but it's very unlikely it was a Muslim. But that person or group of people has invented the most Islamic form of money I, I have ever heard of. Mm. So uh, I think that's a fascinating next step for the Islamic finance industry. I think it's a, it's a big leap, as it is a big leap for the conventional financial industry as well, for many reasons that I'm sure we all know. Mm. But I think that if we can somehow find an intersection between the Islamic economic model, which is really one about good ethics and the real economy and money being a medium of exchange, not a commodity to be traded. And we combine that 
with a sound form of money, and I think Bitcoin is the soundest, then I think we have something really fascinating. And it's not something that, I mean, the work that I do in my, in my business, CCM, I don't describe it as Sharia compliant. I don't I describe it as Islamic finance. It happens to be, yes, but I, I believe that it's, it's applicable to everybody, regardless of faith or no faith. Mm. You know, um, that's why I think this is a really fascinating intersection, and I'm trying to find ways to make that happen. Interesting. Are, you use this, uh, so Sharia compliance, which you mentioned um, that the individual that came to you when he first started working, it was in Dubai, right? Is that where? Mm-hmm. Okay. That he yeah. wanted to work with you, or, or I'm sorry, customers wanted to work with you, but they wanted it to be Sharia compliant. Yeah. What does that entail exactly? And does it pertain to the prohibition on usury? So is that kind of the fundamental... Uh, problem with fiat currency is that it's debt based. Absolutely, um, I, I think sometimes it's sort of simplistically reduced to no interest, right? Say, so Islamic banking, Islamic finance is about not paying interest on a loan. Mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a that's probably a little bit reductive. I I would tend to describe it more as risk sharing, an apportionment of risk mm-hmm. between parties in a transaction. And there is a whole body of jurisprudence around this: how one interacts with one's fellow human beings, mm-hmm. not just in business dealings, but you know, our neighbors, for example, our family members, for example. How do we interact with them? How do we ensure that there is fairness and harmony in society? And business is one aspect of those. Trade is one aspect of this. But fundamentally, if we break it down into what the scriptures say, they say, the Islamic scriptures say that trade is permitted and riba, which is the Arabic word which translates to excess or surplus, is forbidden. So riba is taken to mean all forms of interest. If you had a loan of a million dollars and you charged one cent in interest on it, that's riba. And that's banned. That's, that's a, a considered a very heinous sin uh, because the outcome of it is a great inequality in society. The outcome of it is uh, all the problems that we see today. We are living through an era of unprecedented inequality. We are living through an era of unprecedented uh, mass murder, mechanized murder, pollution, consumerism, waste. Uh, I mean, all kinds, kinds of societal problems. And I believe strongly that many of these things boil down to a system based on usury. And usury comes from fiat money. So I often say that Islamic banking, which is the provision of fractional reserve banks using Sharia compliant you know, uh, contractual structures, Contracts which are based on this body of jurisprudence. It says you can't charge interest and you have to have risk sharing arrangements like investment arrangements rather than loan arrangements. When you combine a fiat based fractional reserve system and you just plant contracts on top which are certified as halal or Islamic, that doesn't necessarily make the whole system Sharia compliant. It's a little bit of a deception if you ask me. So, um, I, you know, I, I think we talk about uh, Sharia compliance and Islamic finance, but we talk about it in very uh, technical terms. We say, oh, I've, the, the scholars will say, the scholars who, who vet these contracts for compliance, they'll look at the contracts and they'll say, well, this is a, a home financing arrangement. And I can see that you have, uh, the bank has bought title to the house and is now leasing to the customer, the borrower, so to speak the part of the house that the customer doesn't own, and then also repays the capital over time, which is fine. Those contracts themselves are based on a real economy transaction. The bank owns something, has title to it, is taking risk on it, and is then leasing something to the customer. Those are perfectly valid contracts. The problem is the bank has the right to create money from nothing. That's the problem. And that itself, if you like, is a form of riba. Riba means excess or surplus. That in itself is a form of usury. So, you know, we can try and find, uh, you know, fancy uh, arcane methods to justify what we're doing and put a, a halal stamp on it. And that's our certificate. And the scholar says, don't worry, I've certified this. The reality is we're just trying to fool God. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, when the industry talks about Sharia compliance, the Islamic finance industry, talks about Sharia compliance, it looks at it in a very narrow way. It doesn't look at it holistically. And I'd like us to take a step back and think about things from first principles. 
and go back to the roots of where Islamic economics comes from. Because Islamic economics is essentially Abrahamic economics. It's the economics of Jesus. I'm, I'm very fond of the passage in the Bible where Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers. It's the only example of Jesus becoming violent that I'm aware of. He was a beautiful gentleman. And, you know, I, I find it very interesting that there's this one occasion where, he, you know, he takes out a whip and he whips the animals out and say, you, you know, you're, you're doing trade in the, in, a, in the house of God and you're, you know, it's a den of robbers and thieves. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think that's amazing. And so I, I find a huge amount of intersection between the monotheistic faiths. Uh, Islamic economics, I think, is, a, is essentially a development of that. And in fact, in the years after the Prophet's death, uh, there were probably a couple of hundred years of further development of this field. Uh, and other scholars came along and they codified the original scriptural principles. So we have this huge body of, of legal work that we can derive from and go back to the rates, uh, the, the roots of trade. That I think is super important. So that's what I've been trying to do with my own company, for example. Rather than trying to replicate what the big banks have, I used to do that. I, I've got to be honest. You know, I've got a part to play in that. You know, I developed the whole Sukuk structures with with Deutsche Bank, uh, Islamic bonds, that is. And I'm trying to unravel that, unwind that. I'm trying to go back to the roots. It sounds like um, moving towards more of an equity based rather than a debt based economy, essentially, right? When you when you invoke terms like risk sharing, yeah. Um, Real economy, right? No usury. These are much more of an equity-based model. So it makes sense that, well, sound money is basically equity-based money, right? Rather than debt-based money. So that makes sense that those would harmonize well. Um, it was explained to me some time ago that R Reba was basically banned. I mean, I don't know if this is because the reason it was banned, but it made sense to not have usury be authorized because it was that was written at a time that the sound money standard was normal. So to borrow in sound money and repay sort of has a built-in interest rate almost because, well, in theory, prices should be coming down over time. So the real debt burden should go up with kind of the natural market price deflation. Is that accurate to say? Like, was I that I think that's not, not unfair to say. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that uh, money needs to circulate. Money needs to do things. It can't just be hoarded. In fact, there is a wealth tax. Uh, one of the, the pillars uh, of Islam is a wealth tax. So everybody has to pay. It's typically 2.5% on a liquid wealth, but then there's other percentage rates applied to other things like livestock or agricultural land. And stuff. But essentially, you're paying 2.5% per annum of your of your wealth. And that is on, on liquid wealth that you frankly have hoarded so it's in your interest in a sense to keep circulating that, that that money in the economy and keep doing something useful and constructive with it mm. uh, and that means investment investment in productive entities uh the real economy real work uh as opposed to what one former regulator in the uk he was the head of the the then fsa uh, fca then uh, in the UK, his name is Lord Adair Turner. He described the vast majority of banking activities as socially useless. So this idea that we invest in financialization is one that is anathema to the Islamic economic model. In the Islamic economic model, it's about circulating money and allowing, allowing prices of commodities to float freely. There should be no central planner. There should be no, you know, it is it is God who who fixes prices. Right. It is the man who fixes prices. So I think free markets also is an essential part of the Islamic economic model. That was straight from the prophet, wasn't it? Well, didn't someone ask him about prices and he said they should be free market determined or by God, rather? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, the prices of commodities were becoming high and a group of people approached him and said, um, can you fix these prices for us? Because essentially you're the governor. And what about it? And he said, no, I cannot because I would be committing a great injustice and I'd have to answer for it on the day of judgment. Mm. And it's always the one who fixes prices and allows them to float. Mm. So that's, I think, a, a really key tradition of the prophet. Mm. It's really important that, um, you know, we, we kind of understand the, the fundamentals behind that. 
you know, there are certain very uh, limited circumstances where uh, there is allowed to be some, uh, yeah, you know, price. Uh, I don't want to use the word fixing. I think that's the wrong word. But there are very limited circumstances in which a, a ruler has the right to do certain things uh, that are, you know, that that ensure, for example, that no monopolies exist. Mm. So there's a tradition of the prophet where um, he uh, he did not allow the merchants in the market to leave the city walls to go and meet the caravans before they arrive in the city so that they can buy the goods outside the city walls uh, at a cheap price and come back to the market and hike up the prices and they now have an effective monopoly. So the ideas of, of monopolies and cartels and consumer protection are already inherent within the Islamic uh, model of jurisprudence. It, there's a number of of traditions, scriptural traditions that ensure, and and in fact, um, without even realizing it, many of them have trickled down into Anglo-Saxon business practices. Um, and as I said uh, said to you earlier, I think you know the uh, the trading that took place on the Silk Route, the Arab and Persian merchants who came down the Silk Route into Southern Europe, into places like Venice, for example, you know they were bringing not just commodities and spices and textiles and so on to be traded. They were bringing ideas. They were early management consultants, if you like. They were bringing new agricultural techniques. They were bringing uh, ideas of um, money exchange, of hawala. Uh, this word check that we have in the English language is derived from the word sak, Arabic word, the plural, plural of which is sukuk, which today means Islamic bonds. And we see sukuk traded on international financial markets today. So, you know, a lot of these early financial developments came about, you know, through these Arab traders pouring into Southern Europe, selling their goods. And, you know, I think we've got a lot of uh, interesting developments that took place in Southern Europe at that time, uh, which, you know, we, we tend to, we tend to, I think there's a tendency for Europe and the US in particular to believe that capitalism started, you know, in places like Venice. Uh, but no, I, I believe it's been around for a lot longer. Than, at least the forms of it that we that we believe to be free markets has been around a lot longer than that. Mm. Now, what capitalism has become today, of course, is a distorted, steroidal nonsense, mm -hmm. you know, which crony capitalism and corruption, uh, and, and that is not at all, I, I believe, what I believe to be capitalism. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's very, in my estimation, unfair to call anything like what we see in the world today as capitalism because we have central banking everywhere, right? So I always say that if money is one half of every transaction and the money is socialistic, then you you know, you're, you can't even be half capitalist at best. Have you ever wanted to live in an off-grid community with complete food, energy, and water independence? If so, then you need to check out the farm at Okefenokee. The farm is a pioneering community designed to foster longevity and well-being, eliminating elements that detract from these goals. At the farm, the convergence of nature, nutritious food, a supportive community, and the ethos of slowing down is unparalleled. Positioned at the gateway to the UNESCO World Heritage-nominated Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge, the farm at Okefenokee stands as a testament to a lifestyle that truly nurtures health and happiness. Unlike conventional housing developments where a token communal garden may suffice, the farm itself is the community. Small, intimate micro-villages seamlessly integrate into the fabric of a sprawling agricultural community. So if you're interested in joining this off-grid community, then go to okefarm.com today to learn more about becoming a member. Make sure to tell them that I sent you for a $21,000 discount on their custom cabin pricing. Again, go to okefarm.com to learn more about joining this revolutionary regenerative agriculture community. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, 
And even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. I'd like to thank my friends at Swan Bitcoin for their long-standing support of the What Is Money show. Swan's mission is to help millions of people get into Bitcoin, so they built the best solution to set up recurring Bitcoin buys and automatic withdrawals into cold storage. With the Swan app, it takes just two minutes to sign up and start buying Bitcoin. If you're a new customer, you get $10 in free Bitcoin for signing up, and the first $10,000 of Bitcoin you buy incurs zero fees. If you're an existing Swan customer, then the next $10,000 of Bitcoin you buy now incurs zero fees. So if you love to recommend Bitcoin to friends and family, then Swan is the best place to start. So go to swanbitcoin.com slash breedlove to get started today. Again, that's swanbitcoin.com slash breedlove. It's interesting that the about God, the relationship between God and price discovery. Um, one of the, I've written some about this, and when I look at the etymology of the word God, one of the words I get to is the Sanskrit term gut, G-H-U-T which means to barter or exchange. So like the word God has exchange built right into it, uh, at least in one aspect. And your point too on goods being traded, right? That that ideas are attached to goods. I mean, in many ways, the, what that brought up for me there was like the ancient Greek word techne, which is the root word of like technology and technique. So in, in reality, like goods are ideas, right? Physically manifest ideas. And then obviously ideas are also goods to the extent the information or the idea is useful. So when we trade, we are intermixing ideas and, you know, spurring innovation. So um, I like Matt Ridley's book on this, The Rational Optimist. He talks about ideas having sex and reproducing as if they're organisms. And so we, through trade, we facilitate that natural selection process, if you will. Um, I want to ask you about Islamic banking and the, and its origins. And you said that perhaps Islamic banking is actually oxymoronic mm -hmm. in a way. Could you expand upon that? Yeah, I, I think the early modern experiments were very good ones and very worthy ones. So if I, if I could pinpoint an origin story for modern Islamic finance, I would say it's 1963. Uh, there was a town uh, in Egypt, about 80 kilometers from Cairo, called Mit Khamer, and there was an experiment conducted by a, a famous economist, and he set up a social uh, savings and investment bank, uh, and this bank took in depositors' money, and that money was used and invested in local industries, and the profits that were earned by these local industries were repaid to depositors in the form of dividends. So a very simple model uh, in Islamic uh, uh, jurisprudence, it's known as mudaraba. Mudaraba means an investment uh, management arrangement. The bank is a manager, the depositors are the owners of the capital, and they form a partnership. So it's not interest, you know, it's not a guaranteed return, there's no guarantee of capital coming back. And the experiment was successful, and another, I think, eight uh, similar social banks uh, arose in Egypt around that time. And then by 19, I guess the mid-70s, 1975, you had the first large wholesale Islamic bank set up in Dubai called Dubai Islamic Bank. And at the same time, the first multilateral called Islamic Development Bank in Saudi. So now finally you have the arrival of the big boys. And you know here we now see the creation of banking activity. And of course, this is where the story starts to go a little bit wrong. Because although, you know, the original, and, and by the way, the scholar that we hired in 2001 was the same individual who was one of the founders of Dubai Islamic Bank back in 1975, 
uh, Sheikh Hussein Hamid Hassan. And, you know, uh, Sheikh Hussein is somebody who fundamentally believed in the risk sharing model, not in a banking or fractional reserve model. Uh, but of course, you know, real politic being what it is, if you want to exist in the world today, you have to replicate what the strongest parties in the world are doing. Uh, you know, if that means creating banks similar to US banks, that's essentially what you do. So these banks were set up that were still fractional reserve institutions. In other words, they created money effectively from nothing, but using Sharia compliant contractual structures, such as the Mudaraba that I just described, this investment management arrangement. Um, so I guess that's sort of a half win, not a full win. And then by the 1980s, you got the Malaysians coming along. They're creating slightly more sophisticated product. Uh, by the mid 90s, you've got HSBC turning up and Citibank. And now you've got retail products uh, being available to Muslims across the world. And then you've got Deutsche Bank in 2001 setting up an office in Dubai and suddenly designing these funky, never seen before, sophisticated investment banking instruments. And now the whole world, the whole spectrum of financial instruments has opened up to Islamic investors who want to invest in line with the principles of their faith. Somewhere along the way, it goes a little bit wrong because the investment bankers get greedy. And we had something in Deutsche Bank, which I call the Manhattan Project. It was our Manhattan Project. Um, we created a financial instrument, a very sophisticated black box, essentially, that could replicate the returns from literally any financial instrument. It, it sounds crazy, and it is crazy, but that's what it could do. And, you know... You could take anything that was quite obviously non-Sharia compliant, you know, an investment in companies that, that manufacture alcohol-based uh, products, right? Uh, which, of course, is not Sharia compliant. But you could replicate the returns from that using this black box technology. Essentially, it was based on a total return swap. Like a, and, like a stable coin of sorts. Yeah, in a way, you could say that. Yeah, I think that's not a bad analogy. Um, so... You know, here we have this generic fatwa. A fatwa is a legal opinion from our, our board of scholars, of whom Sheikh Hussein was the chairman. Uh, and it was for the technique itself. The technique was fine. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the, the technology that we developed. A little, bit, a little bit like saying blockchain is a technology, Bitcoin is the actual product. So um, the sales guys, of course, got wind of this. You know what in the investment banking culture is like. Sales guys are very aggressive people. And they realized that this was a license to print money. So all kinds of very dubious uh, products with clearly non-Sharia compliant origins were deployed using this particular black box. Mm. One very famous scholar in the industry, uh, an American called Sheikh Yusuf De Lorenzo, he described it as the doomsday fatwa because he thought that this was explosive. Mm. Uh, and I think he was right. So there was a very public spat, a public fight between the two scholars, our own Sheikh Hussein and Sheikh Yusuf in the US. And, you know, they, they really disagreed over this. But essentially, ultimately, you know, since Prevail, they had a, a, a mature scholarly debate over it. And Sheikh Hussein realized that this technique, which by itself as a technology was perfectly valid, could be open to abuse. So he, uh, you know, established some parameters around it. But this Manhattan Project, I call it that because, you know, it was like developing the atomic bomb, you know, it, it the release of nuclear energy is a, is a force for good or evil. And fortunately, you know, when the wrong people get hold of it, you know, bad things happen. So our Manhattan Project was this particular black, black box. And I think that spoiled the industry. Anyway, it so happened that the financial crisis hit in 2007, 2008, and people stopped buying these products anyway. So in a way, it's kind of a blessing. Uh, and then since then, the Islamic finance industry has been essentially stagnant. The big bulge bracket investment banks, the city banks, JP Morgan's, Deutsche Bank's, Goldman's have essentially left that industry. They uh, they don't really see the potential in it anymore. They don't have the champions within those organizations to push it forward. And all of the the old timers like me who made that stuff happen 20, 25 years ago have essentially left that traditional industry. So it doesn't really happen amongst the big investment banks anymore. And you're seeing now the proliferation of small, early stage Islamic fintech communities and companies and entrepreneurs who are trying to solve problems at the grassroots level. So I'll give you one example. In the UK, there is a small group of 
former, uh, you know, uh, uh, big city lawyers, uh, 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 big four consulting and accounting uh, practice uh, individuals who have created a home financing company that is non-debt based, that is based on a pure risk sharing technique, similar to the Mudaraba that I just described to you. And this, I think, is very wholesome. It's the type of product that leads to a uh, a harmonious society. Of course, uh, it will have its challenges because trying to create an ethical product in a world that is fundamentally greedy, because human nature is greedy, is a challenge. But I'm very pleased to know they've raised a lot of money, commercially becoming quite successful, and I, I think it's a it's a huge demonstration of what is possible when people believe in an idea. And Bitcoin is a similar type of idea. It's something that was created out of a sense of we need to fix a broken economy. How do we do that? And at first, you know, it's a group of man, you know people considered lunatics on the fringe, you know, doing something crazy. And you know, why would you rail against central bankers? Central bankers are wonderful human beings, you know, and they're the establishment. And we love the IMF and the World Bank. And governments have our best interests at heart. But you know, real people, when they sit back and think from first principles, they realize that there's there's ancient wisdom out there, you know, that is more wor- uh, worthwhile for us to study than what the the latest prime minister or president or central banker is telling us. Uh, you know, I don't think those people have our interests at heart. I think their actions have shown that to be the case. And you know, I, I'm a strong believer that ancient wisdom is a much better way to guide humanity. So I, I think that when communities realize that there are ways to do business and trade with each other that are wholesome and real economy and harmonious and leads to the reduction of trade barriers and, and ultimately leads to peace between different types of people, then I think that's something that we should seriously look at. I think Bitcoin is one of those things. I think the types of products that I'm seeing from young people at the grassroots doing Islamic fintech is a very similar type of activity. And I, I'm very keen on supporting that. Yeah, amen to that. I mean, I, I think it's very important for people to, well, what's the old saying that no man is better than his incentives? So if you look at what people are telling you through the lens of them talking their own book, so to speak, I think that's a very useful framing oftentimes. And you know, I again, I've had, I've heard these arguments, right? Oh, Jerome Powell's a great guy. What do you mean? It's like I don't actually care which individual is in that position. It's like that position should not exist. Is the point? Yeah. Um, so it's more of an institutional, systemic change that I think Bitcoiners are after than trying to, you know, chase down any particular political actor and wag the finger. Um, but yeah, as as you were describing that, you calling that the Manhattan Project, that was a nice tie-in to the. I think it was Buffett that called them derivatives, weapons of financial mass destruction. And um, yeah, you know, if there's a will, there's a way, right? Even if there are these, you know, at the, basically these are ethical laws, right? And But to your point, there's the realm of real politic where you have to compete on the same technological footing as your opponent. Otherwise, you're going to get outrun. And uh, yeah, difficult area, right? Where, you know, it's going to happen no matter what. And then I guess you have to have kind of these moral ethical debates for people to lay down some parameters or guidance. Um, that's, that's interesting to think about. Um, okay. So obviously fiat economies today, it's increasingly evident that they are very broken. Um, I, I assume you would argue this has to do with the rooting and debt-based fiat currency to a greater or lesser extent. Yes. Um, you've also said that maybe we could use a little dose of faith-based thinking in our economic systems. Um, and maybe this has this relates to how you look at value, right? Uh, like actual, you know, rational exchange value in the marketplace versus something more qualitative. Um, what, what do you mean when you say we could use a dose of faith-based thinking how would you see that practically realized in our approach to economics? So I think that when we uh, we establish this body of knowledge called economics and we say, uh, you know, the corporation is an entity that exists solely for the benefit 
of profit maximization. I think we are on a very slippery slope there, and we're essentially saying greed is good. Mm-hmm. Greed is always good. Greed is the most important thing for humanity. And then we start using metrics like GDP to measure our progress. Mm-hmm. Human progress is measured in GDP. It's the one single thing. That the, what's the G7? You know, what's the G20? Right. We measure these companies based on how much money they make, mm-hmm. and that is an exchange value. We don't measure their experiential value. So what is experiential value? Experiential value is our happiness, our suicide rates, our divorce rates, our literacy rates, our environmental pollution. You know, these are all qualitative things that we don't take account of in GDP. Actually, ironically, uh, these things being worse sometimes make our GDP go up. An uh, example is used by a Greek economist called Yanis Varifakis who uses the example of a forest fire. And he says, when a forest fire takes place, well, you've got to get the firemen to the forest fire and get the helicopters and get the water. And, you know, you've got to pay for the fuel to get them there and you've got to pay wages and so on. And so GDP actually goes up. But of course, you don't have a forest anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, experiential value has gone down. So this blunt single measure that we use of human progress is a nonsense, really. It's a way to measure human progress. And I think if we if we introduce a little bit of qualitative, moral, and ethical thinking, uh, and a lot of the principles are uh, are broadly similar acro- across religions. They don't have to relate to one particular religion. There's a debate taking place in the UK amongst the chattering classes as to whether the UK has lost its Christian ethos. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I would say that a Christian ethos and a, a Muslim ethos and a Jewish ethos are, are essentially the same. The overlap is more than 90% across them. We differ at the margins and we focus too much on those differences. And as a result, in public life, we want to drill out this idea that faith should have any place in politics or finance or anything. Mm-hmm. You know, we mustn't always separate. Uh, you know anything that we do in the workplace from faith? Well, everything I do on a daily basis, uh, on a minute by minute basis, is driven by my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the way the way I, I at least I hope so. I'm not saying I'm a good Muslim. I'm just somebody who recognizes that I need to try and be one. Mm-hmm. Uh, try and follow my faith, even if I get it wrong sometimes. And you know that's the way I interact with my mother or my wife or my children the way I interact with my neighbors, the way I interact on a, a daily basis in my work. Uh, how, how quickly do I pay my invoices, for example? Do I pay a debt as soon as it becomes due, or do I think, well, I've got 60 days to pay this, so I'll think I'll wait until 59.9 days. Maybe I'll delay it over then, see if they send me a reminder. That's not the way I think, because that's not an Abrahamic way you think. It's not how Jesus would have thought. That's not how Muhammad would have thought. So it's very, very important to me personally that as human beings, we do rely on this ancient wisdom. And you may not believe in it. You may not be a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Sikh. You may not be. But you at least must recognize that there is some value in following those ethical principles. And we should try to maintain those ethical principles in our daily lives, in business, in finance, in politics. To try and separate the two completely, I think, is is a nonsense. Well said. I, I, it's almost like with the, the ancient wisdom thing is you all, you. I don't like the word should, but I'm going to use it here. You almost should default to following the ancient wisdom because it was distilled from many lifetimes of experience, and you've had but one yeah. part part of one lifetime, right? So, the fact that you might believe that you figured out something that countless lifetimes haven't figured out yet is slim to none, right? So, um, I'm actually reminded, sorry, I started getting off topic here. I'm reminded of uh, 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 Sam Bankman fried when he said that um, every book can be reduced to a six-post blog, right? I mean, you know, he didn't feel the need to read books because, you know, who needs to read books? And this is somebody who is supposed to be incredibly gifted intellectually, Right, but clearly is lacking in wisdom, and I would choose wisdom over high intellect every single time. Clearly, 
Absolutely. Yeah. If anything, high intellect is going to accelerate you going in the wrong direction if you lack wisdom. Yeah. Um, as is the case in point for Mr. SBF. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious. So the, the example you gave of the forest fire that was like increasing GDP, right? Because we have to send the firefighters and, and whatnot. I'm pretty persuaded by Rothbard's argument about private property being the solution to a lot of this. And so if I, if I think through that example and, and Rothbard basically is advocating for the universalization of private property so that there would be no public publicly owned anything, everything would be privately owned. And therefore there would be some individual responsible for every asset basically in the world. So in the case of the forest fire, some forest owner would suffer a significant asset impairment as a result of that fire. And so we would actually see, I think, as I understand it, an economic contraction. So I wonder, I was just curious what your views are on that. Like, should we try to lean more into privatization of property? And if that would rectify that, you know, the example of, uh, say, a forest fire leading to economic growth? Yeah. I think my answer is no. And the reason is because I believe that the earth is essentially a gift from God and we are stewards of it and it's our job to preserve it. And sometimes that means that there is a communal responsibility on us to look after things. Um, just as, for example, um, certainly in the Islamic faith, faith, when somebody dies, there is a responsibility on the community to attend their funeral. Um, even if only one person attended, the responsibility for the community is uh, is um, you know, is fulfilled. So there are certain things I believe are that we collectively need to look after, and um, there is a concept uh, in Islam of the endowment or the trust. The waqf is the original word. In fact, uh, curiously, it's a concept that has trickled into English law over the years. The trust law. Uh, so if you look at the statutes of endowment of one of the very first colleges of Oxford University, which was Merton College, the statutes are essentially a word-for-word -word translation of an equivalent waqf or endowment of a, a college in Jerusalem at the time. And the reason for that is because the founder of Merton College was the head of the Knights Templar, so he would have been based in Jerusalem at some point, and he would have seen these documents and studied this this body of law that the Muslims had produced, transported it back to England, and when he established his college, Merton College, Oxford, in I think 1264 or whatever it was, you know, he essentially took a translation of that endowment and established what is effectively the first one of the first trust law documents in English law. So this type of concept, the endowment, is something that is for the good of the community. Um, and in fact, we saw other similar institutions set up under the time of the second caliph of Islam after the death of the Prophet, which was uh, what they called Beit al-Mal, uh, which essentially translates to house of wealth, which was a government treasury to ensure that widows and orphans and others who were vulnerable were provided for and cared for if they could not afford to do it themselves and they didn't have any other, anyone else to, to help them. Uh, and this kind of first concept of the welfare state under certain, you know, strict principles is perhaps one of the first of its kind. Um, so I, I'm I'm not entirely in favor of of everything privatization. I think there is a balance to be had. The concept of private property property is extremely uh, important in Islamic economics. It is a, a fundamental principle to preserve private property in Islam. But it also means that we, it, it doesn't uh, stop us from recognizing our collective obligations. Mm -hmm. So endowments that, for example, extract water from the ground, wells that, uh, you know, feed uh, widows and orphans, that's a collective responsibility. And if there was one widow or one orphan who went hungry, then that is a collective sin and we are all responsible for it. So I think there is a balance to be had. Man, I am. Um, I don't disagree about the collective good, the greater good, communal good, but I get very weary when we talk about 
arbitrarily violating private property to serve that greater good, because then you introduce that window of opportunity for the demagoguery right, for someone to get in there and they, you know, they, they start using the greater good as the carte blanche to do anything, right? And this is the hallmark of many, many authoritarians across history, right? It's always, everything they do is for the greater good. So like, how do you reconcile that? How do you, how do you hold that, those people in check, right? That, that might always make that moral or ethical appeal to the greater good, but use it to serve, well, whatever agenda they may have. Yeah. So traditionally, at the time of the companions who came after the prophet, so in the couple of centuries following his death, traditionally there was a separation of the judiciary from the state. And uh, the judiciary was there to uh, correct the imbalance. So where a ruler was unjust, uh, there's a very famous example of a, a, a very famous classical scholar called Imam Abu Hanifa who uh, was asked by the governor of Kufa, where he lived, which is essentially modern-day Iraq, uh, uh, to become the, the judge for that district. And he says, I won't do it because if this ruler required me to cut the head off somebody, am I supposed to oblige him? Uh, and of course, he was imprisoned and poisoned and flogged and eventually you know, murdered for, for his dissension. Uh, but there's a very strong principle, a very strong tradition in Islam, of separating the judiciary from from state, from the from the ruler, and uh, this I think is is one of those uh, intrinsic checks and balances that are supposed to be implemented. Of course, they are not. Of course, today, you know, we have a, a you know a world full of authoritarian rulers who impose their own rules, and there are no checks and balances. So, you know, those rules of Islam are not really being followed. Um, and it, it, it disturbs me sometimes that people say, oh, yeah, but they do this in Saudi and UAE and Bahrain. And I say, well, you know, well, that's that's neither here nor there. That's not Islam. That's not Islam as, as, as it was traditionally practiced. So I, I, I hear what you say. I hear the idea of violation of, of private property uh, and, uh, you know, the, the idea that a, a single individual or a small group of individuals have the right to appropriate assets. Yes, that's a huge violation. Uh -huh. But it's a violation in the faith, and there should be an independent body that analyzes that body of jurisprudence. As, this is wrong. You can't do it. So then was the judiciary under the purview of the church in that scenario, where it's separate from the state, or is it just an independent body entirely? Uh, well, it's uh, the judiciary in Islam is based on Sharia law. So it is required to implement the, the rules of Sharia. So if the rules of Sharia say, for example, that a ruler is not allowed to appropriate assets, which it does, then you know, they are required to, to uh, you know, give that directive. Now, it's then up to the ruler whether it's enforced or not. So that's the right, right, right. Do you think Bitcoin changes the calculus in that logic somewhat? Like actually giving, I guess if the ruler is expropriating assets you know, in the name of the greater good to do whatever that's not yeah. good. Does Bitcoin, yeah. I guess, afford people a more practical means of resistance to the ruler? I think it's a, a brilliant form of resistance money. Uh, and we live in a, a highly polarized authoritarian world where depending on the preferences of whoever is currently in power, you may or may not be in favor. And one should not be subject to you know the the possession of your personal assets on the basis of whether your particular brand of politics is liked or not by the ruler. So I think it's a brilliant form of resistance money. Uh, I know uh, people on the ground in Gaza who have saved lives uh, with it being distributed through Bitcoin and Tether. Sorry, I hate to mention a something that's not Bitcoin, but you know the this the money that obviously there are. Many restrictions on sending money into Gaza because of mm. the concerns in the global financial system as to where that money will really end up, and often those concerns are based on a kind of hysterical response to you know certain stories. For example, UNRWA, the uh, the UN uh, relief agency, uh, you know the the idea that you know they were infiltrated by a proscribed group, uh, which turned out to be false, of course, but simply on the basis of that hearsay, funding was stopped to them. And people started starving to death. So what do you do in this situation? You have to find non-banking channels to get aid into people. And 
It turned out that Bitcoin is one of those channels and governments can't do anything about it. So if they don't like, uh, you know, a, a particular, uh, let me take another example, um, Afghanistan. Now, you know, we may have views on what we think about the Taliban as the ruling administration of Pakistan. But when they came back to power a few years ago, of course, that was not a happy event for the United States government. And uh, they immediately froze $7 billion of Afghan reserves, which were held in the U.S., which was a huge problem because during that winter, many people starved and died of exposure in a freezing Afghan winter. And, uh, you know, this was, uh, uh, this was, you know, almost literally putting a gun to the head of the Afghan people saying, we don't like your government, so we're going to let you starve. This is, we know it's your money, but we're not going to give it to you. Now, Bitcoin solves that, right? There are no banks and rails that you need to go through. We are each our own private bank. We can sell custody. And that's what I love about it. It's pure freedom money. Uh, and whatever your polit political affiliation, whatever your beliefs, if today, you know, a particular type of belief is ruled as, you know, uh, non-belief and you are a, a pariah as a result of it, even though humans may have held that belief for 5,000, 10,000 years, if today that is considered, you know, bad thought, so to speak, should one be censored for that? I, I find the world a deeply scary place, and I find the banking system deep, the, the most efficient way of censoring people. So, you know, for me, it's really, really important that people are free to believe what they want to believe. Yeah, there's a yeah really deep. This is something RFK said when I spoke to him, but his realization during the Canadian trucker protest that. The freedom to transact was basically a prerequisite of freedom of speech. Yeah. So in many ways, it's more primary than the freedom of speech itself, because if you can't control your purchasing power, well, then you, you know, you can get shut off of well, life, right? Food, shelter, communications, et cetera, travel. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope people are starting to wake up to that. I mean, I guess that's that's where censorship backfires. It's like the more that it's engaged in, the more you're awakening people to the reality of, hey, well, I'm not going to hold my savings in the U.S. anymore because, well, you just turn it off when it's convenient for you. Um, these are like, you know, little billboards for Bitcoin, basically. Are you sick of being robbed by politicians through inflation and endless money printing? If so, you need to be at Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee on July 25th through 27th. As the largest Bitcoin and fintech conference in the world, Bitcoin 2024 stands as a beacon of monetary freedom, a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Top speakers, companies, and thought leaders from across the industry will convene in Nashville to look ahead to the next year and beyond. I will be there, and Bitcoin conferences like this have become my favorite place to socialize since becoming a Bitcoiner. Ticket prices will increase soon. Get your tickets now and secure your spot at this game-changing event. So go to b.tc slash conference and use discount code BREEDLOVE to sign up for the Bitcoin 2024 conference. Again, that's b.tc slash conference Discount code BREEDLOVE. Over the past nine years, I've been going through a pretty serious struggle with my personal health. It started with a sharp pain and stiffness in my hip after a lifting injury, which I later learned was related to some pretty extensive inflammation in my gut. Then I developed an autoimmune issue, and soon I was having joint pain all over, skin irritations, and all kinds of digestive issues. I visited many doctors trying to figure out what was wrong, but none of them were able to help me fix any of my issues. I eventually started to see an energy healer with whom I had some limited success, but it wasn't until I started working with a biohacker, Anthony D. Clementi, last year that I was finally able to start making real progress on my healing journey. Anthony spent a lot of time with me learning about my specific situation and worked with me to adapt a custom health plan to address my needs. Anthony has served as a personal biohacker for celebrities, billionaires, and professional athletes all over the world. Besides helping people like me overcome health issues, Anthony and his world-class medical team also help guys that just want to optimize their cognitive performance, 
guys that want to pack on some muscle, and guys that just want to get shredded. Anthony keeps a tight book of business and is selective about the clients he brings on. To apply for Anthony's biohacking services, text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Again, to apply for Anthony's biohacking services, just text BREEDLOVE to 847-943-7221. Okay, so you've already you've already said basically sound money is inherently compatible with Islamic economics. Um, I'm assuming, and you said Bitcoin is sound money, so I'm assuming Bitcoin is Sharia compliant. But I'd like for you to like go into that and you know speak to, I guess, the Islamic audience that may not be familiar with Bitcoin or sound money. Why is Bitcoin? Sharia compliant in your view and and why does it fix so many of these problems we've touched on today? Yeah, there's a very fundamental debate taking place uh, in the Islamic community right now. Over the last few years, a number of very senior scholars, I would tend to describe them more as social media scholars, have issued fatwas or legal opinions on Bitcoin being haram. Haram is religiously impermissible. Mm -hmm. So they banned it, they made it forbidden they have used the usual FUD, you know, so it's it's money laundering, it's terrorism money, it's drug money. Uh, you know, it's not backed by anything real, it's intangible, no government supports it. So they'll use whatever arguments they can use, and we've heard all of these arguments in the conventional space, and they use the same arguments. Now, fundamentally, I, I think they have made two mistakes. The first is that they have failed to understand what Bitcoin is and what the current financial system is. Because Bitcoin is good and the current financial system is bad, but they think it's the other way around. And then the second thing is they they have failed to... There's um, the famous phrase by Upton Sinclair, which is, it is difficult to get a man to understand a thing when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. Yeah. So who is the scholars, right? These are government-appointed scholars. And it's therefore in their interest to say, oh, you can't use this type of money because then, you know, it's a problem for my government. So, you know, I I respect... Like the, the Keynesian economic high priest too. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, yeah. yeah. And I have these debates all the time. So there's a, a famous multilateral bank in the Islamic space who have their own armies of economists and theologians who justify conventional fiat money and the fractional reserve banking model as a good thing, even though it's in clear violation of Islamic principles from first principles. Absolutely clearly, but they still could justify it because that's who pay their salaries. Anyway, so you know, there's this ongoing debate, and I'm very pleased to note that a number of younger, more dynamic scholars who are at the sort of cutting edge, the cold face of the financial services industry they're working on early stage Islamic fintech companies, for example, and they're also very well versed in the theological arguments. And they have done some fantastic analysis uh, of uh, of Bitcoin, specifically Bitcoin, uh, and to a degree other forms of digital assets and cryptocurrency, for example. And they tend to conclude these individuals. They tend to conclude that Bitcoin has certain characteristics that make it very favorable for uh, within the Islamic economic model. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily go as far as saying what I say, which is that Bitcoin is the most Islamic form of money ever invented. And I'm absolutely firm on that. I sincerely believe that. Mm -hmm. But many of them have reached a conclusion that this is something that we can work with. Uh, And maybe that gold standard that we used to live on for 700 years Maybe it can come back under a Bitcoin standard, and they've concluded that. Mm. Is they look for three things according to the sort of theological position. They look for uh, the the aspect of is it wealth. They look for the aspect of is it does it have legal standing, and the third thing is does it have the characteristics of medium of exchange. Mm. So they look for those three things to call it money, and and some of them conclude yeah we think it's certainly got legal uh, identity. We certainly believe that it is a form of wealth, and we're pretty close to being convinced that it's now a form of money, or at least it's getting there. Mm. So I think that that's really, really helpful. And that debate is now starting to turn around. And you've probably seen in countries like the UAE, they've got huge initiatives in place 
to set up new digital asset fintech companies. They're talking a lot about crypto, which I think is a shame. But you know, let's see if we can try and turn that around a little bit and see if it can start to differentiate between crypto and Bitcoin. Uh, because I think once they they see that, there's, there's going to be a sea change and a lot of exciting stuff happening out there. Um, that's not to say that I'm completely against the 99% of the digital asset space that is generally called crypto. Um, I think there might be some interesting technologies there. I just don't think there's anything interesting from a monetary point of view. That's all. Mm -hmm. So um, th that's, that's where I think the debate is heading within Islamic circles. And I think we're starting to see small uh, early stage companies, entrepreneurs who are saying, well, I don't know too much about Islamic finance, but I know what the scriptures say about Islamic economics. And I'm a coder and I know stuff about, uh, about Bitcoin and about digital assets. And I am going to create some form of institution, some company that solves a particular financial need or problem. So that's very exciting to me because now we have Muslims who are saying, well, I think this Bitcoin thing is really Sharia compliant. Mm. It's really in accordance with our ethical principles and this model that we call Islamic economics. Um, it's nothing like Islamic banking. Many of them have concluded completely independently. You know, they've come to their own conclusion that Islamic banking is an oxymoron. It's a sort of deception. Mm. How can something that is truly Islamic when it creates money from nothing mm. in the fraction of their system that the money... That is, that is used as its basis is itself created through debt. You know, that doesn't make any sense to them. Right. So they themselves have concluded, well, I need to work with Bitcoin and I need to create financial institutions around that. Where I think they need the help is on the finance aspect of things. And that's where I think people like me come in because I've spent 30 years doing this stuff, you know, it involves bracket firms and other financial institutions. And I understand how that side of things work. And I don't want to replicate what the big banks do. I don't want to replicate what the financial system does today. I don't want to recreate financialization in a Bitcoin form. I want to create a true form of trade finance, working capital finance in a Bitcoin form. Mm. I'm glad you brought up the incentives of those dissenting religious opinions about Bitcoin because that was going to be my question. It's like, who's paying these guys? Just like we talked about earlier, right? No man's better than his incentives. Yeah. Um, and on the aspect of, you know, generations viewing it differently, I, there's a distinctly generational thing here, you know, and not to say you have to be a certain, below a certain age to get Bitcoin, but I think mentally you do have to be below yeah. a certain age, right? You have to be, yeah, right. I, I don't know, more familiar or at least open to digital technology as a so, real solution to real problems, right? Whereas if you're extremely old school, well, then you're probably a gold bug, right? And that's... That's okay, I guess. And I there's there's this kind of impartial, impersonal element to Bitcoin. Uh, there's a saying that science advances from funeral to funeral. And I think there's a bit of that in Bitcoin too. It's like you just kind of have to let younger people that that gravitate to or accept the role of digital technology in in their lives, like in making, you know, in determining major features of their life uh, up to and including money, right? You have to let that population sort of come of age before I think Bitcoin really gets broadly accepted. And that's obviously not nice to say. It's like, what are you saying? A bunch of old people need to die off. It's like, well, I think that may, that may be necessary for the adoption curve for many major technologies like Bitcoin. Um, that's a very interesting point. I, I'm, I'm reminded of a friend of mine, very close friend and one of the smartest people I know, a really super clever guy, uh, he did maths and competition at Oxford. Uh, you know, he's been a, a senior industry executive for many years. Um, you know, I had tried to orange pill him so many times, and I've tried to explain to him why Bitcoin can lead to a better world that is more aligned with our faith, because mm -hmm. uh, he's a Muslim like me. And he just doesn't get it. You know, you know he, he's an establishment guy. And you talked about this age gap. And, and sometimes it's just, you know, there's just this gap. And people believe that organizations like the central bank and the IMF and governments have our interests at heart. I fundamentally don't believe that. I, I don't know why that is. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a rebel at heart. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, but young people don't have that. And I was having this conversation with him. 
And his 14-year-old nephew just kind of walked into the conversation. And then he just took over the conversation. And he started talking to my friend saying, yeah, and like Bitcoin is like this and it's like that. And, you know, and then it's, and it does this and, and, you know, you can use it to do this and it's, it's finite, it's divisible and it's this. And I'm like, wow, this kid just did my job for me. He just completely gets it. I, I didn't have to say anything. He just completely understood it. And you're right. There's this generation gap. They just get it when they're young. And I, that to me is really encouraging yeah. because I, I, you know, it, there's, as you get older, you know, there's a tendency to moan about the younger generation to say, you know, it was harder in my day and at least kids that what, you know, but actually I was harder. That is a myth. I really do. I, I don't think there's as many snowflakes as we think there are. Yeah. You know, I, I'm actually quite excited. I do. I speak to university students a lot. I go and do a lot of lectures uh, in London and elsewhere. And, you know, I'm really heartened by the response that I get from students. You know, they're really on it. They really understand this. So I'm extremely optimistic about the future. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of good things to come, and I think we can we can fix a broken economy. I think it's possible with the generation that's coming up. Yeah, I'm I'm optimistic as well, uh, given the level of transparency and the liquidity of ideas in the digital age. I just can't imagine thirty to fifty years from now that people are still accepting the scam of government sponsored paper currency. I just I think the light, you know. The sunlight is going to disinfect that entire idea over time, and I, I'm encouraged by young people picking up on these these ideas as well, um, because ultimately it is just a psychological a psyop, basically, right? It's like you have to convince people that printing money is good for them. You know, the whole inflation is necessary for a healthy economy. Yeah, like it's all bunk, basically. Once you feel that receive wisdom, I, I don't understand yeah. why people just believe what the priests speaking Latin are saying to them. Just, right. just understand the Latin and and dissect it and take it back to English and yeah. understand. And, and they're not doing that. Yeah, and this is where there's a bit of that like Gutenberg printing press like disruptive potential, where it's yeah. people are no longer taking the quote unquote priest at their word. They're having a direct relationship with information or the word in this case. Yeah. Um, and so people are you know doing their own research, so to speak, to figure out how money actually works and. Thanks to, you know, I guess peer-to-peer -peer media and the internet in general, that research enterprise is much more feasible than it was pre-internet. So um, I'm very excited by that. I want to ask you, so you've said this, when Bitcoin, as you said, is a very strong position. Sounds like a hill maybe you would even die on. Bitcoin is the most Islamic form of money we have ever had. What is it specifically that informs uh, your position and its certainty. Okay. So I think the key is low time preference. Mm. I think the key here is that uh, Muslims and Christians are low time preference people. Their mindset is one in which they store good deeds in this life for the hereafter, mm. right? That's the ultimate in deferred gratification. And we are say saying that we will sacrifice things today to ensure a re reward tomorrow. And that tomorrow it may be a long time in the future. And we have to have faith and belief that there'll be a day of reckoning at which we'll receive that reward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that patience and deferred gratification that we have is a sort of ultimate low time preference. And it just so happens that Bitcoin, by its nature, is low time preference, mm -hmm. inflationary, not inflationary. In modern corporate finance and economics textbooks, they teach uh, techniques like discounted cash flow, DCF. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a very simple mathematical formula that discounts the value of future yields, future profits from a business more and more as they go out into the future. So this model incentivizes you to make as much money as possible today. It's like saying, I want seven breakfasts today rather than one breakfast every day for the next week. Mm -hmm. So this DCF model, this discounted cash flow model, ultimately leads to desertification of the planet, for example, because rather than do sustainable agriculture, it wants to intensively farm today until you desertify that land within a few years, which of course makes no sense. Because it means we're not providing for our grandchildren and our, our future generations. So 
Bitcoin, by its nature, being deflationary, is the ultimate in low time preference. Um, so Muslims, as you know, there's a month called Ramadan during which we, for 30 days, we deny ourselves. It's not just about denying ourselves food and drink for those 30 days. It's about trying to be a better person, trying to discipline our ego, trying to check our egos. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, again, you know, we're all sinners. I'm not saying I'm a perfect human being, but that's a month in which I try and train myself to try and be a better person because God knows I need it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's an example of people who have low time preference and they, they're again investing for their future mentally, the spiritual health, their mental health, their physical health. Our bodies are a gift from God. I mean, not to look after your body to me is a sin. Right. Uh, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's inherent in being mm -hmm. that east who believes that their bodies are a gift from God. You know that you look after it, that you look after your planet. So this is a kind of, uh, in a very roundabout way of saying, what if there's a monetary system that forced us, that nudged us in that direction, and stopped us being consumers? I think it's safe with the Amus who came up with the model of the, uh, the the fiat business model. You know where you you're incentivized to borrow, spend, consume, borrow, spend, consume, borrow, spend, consume ad infinitum. Until you've desertified the planet and you've chucked all your plastics in the ocean and you've killed all the wildlife and all the rest of it, right? I mean, do we need to change our mobile phones every 12 months and our cars every two years? And do we need to extract equity from our mortgages so I can build a new conservatory at the back of the house? You know, no, of course we don't. You know, when something breaks, do I buy a new one or do I, do I try and fix it? My father came from a generation where he fixed anything and everything. He just could. You know, he just had that magic touch. And my generation only just got that. And I know my kids' generation will not have it. They'll just replace it with something brand new. This is a, a, a wasteful, mindless way of living. And it's not a good way of living. And we're going to kill our planet. You know, we, we talk about the reasons for, you know, climate change and environmental pollution. Well, this is it. Consumerism is the reason for it. Right. It's because we're, you know, eating too much shit and we're throwing away too much and we're not fixing stuff. So, that's why I think a monetary system that forces us away from financialization, that forces us away from borrow, spend, consume, and a type of currency that by itself is inherently anti-riba, anti-usury, because you can't simply create it from nothing. You need work to mine it, to extract it, and to earn it. You can't just suddenly magic it out of nothing. So it's not magic internet money. The real magic money is fiat money. And that's why I think Bitcoin is inherently Islamic because it encourages that deferred gratification, investing in our afterlife mindset. And that's a very Islamic thing. That's a very Christian thing. Mm. Oh, it's beautifully said. I, it really is not that complicated. I know Bitcoin itself is complicated, but sort of the problem that it solves is, I think, relatively well known. I mean, at least if not well known amongst people today, but if you kind of look into history just a little bit, I mean, it's pretty clear that this has been a problem for a long time. Uh, you know, broken money brought down ancient Rome and it's caused problems all over the world for basically forever, right? Since time immemorial. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you one last thing, a little more philosophical perhaps, but it's about faith itself. Um, I forget, maybe it was Kierkegaard. He said, faith is an act of openness to the unknown. And I feel like there's kind of a paradox built into this because to really have an attitude or an act to act openly toward the unknown, it's like we do that a little bit better when we have something that's really known. So it's almost like, you know, um, we're better at dealing with uncertainty when we have some piece of certainty to hold on to. Right. So like what an analogy here might be like, if you were going to go hiking out in the wilderness and pioneer new territory, well, you'd probably at least want the certainty of, you know, a, a couple of weeks food, right? Something like that. So you didn't have to just, you know, figure it out when you got out there. That would give you a greater means to go and explore and be open to the unknown and chart new territory. And so I think that's what we're saying with Bitcoin, right? It's like, let's just give people this little slice of certainty. It's just fixed supply, 
you know, can't inflate it, very hard to steal if you custody it properly. So it it holds your purchasing power really well. And maybe maybe that's the problem with Bitcoin right now. It's like, that's not so obvious because it's so volatile at this stage in its monetization that people actually look at it like it's this wildly uncertain thing. When in reality, it's the most certain thing we've ever created as a species, as far as I can tell. Um, do you think Bitcoin then enables us to be more faith-based just because it gives us this little slice of certainty to act to have this act of openness towards uncertainty or the unknown do you know I, I think it might work on two levels I, I think that people who don't necessarily have any faith um uh, and don't set any set any store by it uh, they can be brought to this through sheer logic mm-hmm. if if logic is their religion uh, and i'm not i'm not judging that I'm just saying if that's, if that's how they judge things, then you know they can be brought to it through the sheer power of maths. That's it. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, uh, if like me, you believe that there is a God and he's all-powerful and that he will judge us for our actions on earth, then uh, I, I am... It's interesting. You, you, know, you, you kind of talked about unknown unknowns. Um, somehow... I am 100% certain that God is real because I see miracles all the time. Uh, I see the rising of the sun as a miracle. Uh, and the, the world around me. And if we did the numbers, we'd realize the chances of us existing and now having this conversation are infinitesimally small. And the maths is ridiculously, uh, uh, makes it ridiculously improbable that human life is here in discussing these things. And yet somehow I'm expected to believe that I'm a random sequence of mutations that came about from a random sequence of interactions of gas molecules mm-hmm. sometime after the Big Bang, which happened in and of itself. This doesn't make any sense to me. That's not logical. That's just maths. So I'm convinced that there is a God. And I'm convinced that he sent messengers to the earth and I've listened to those messages and I may not be a particularly good person, but I hope on the day of judgment, my balance will be in my favor. I hope through the actions that I do on this earth. And I think one of those is to put my skills to use to assist in the creation uh, or the rolling out of a financial system that does good for everybody not simply one group of people. And I think there are a large enough group of believers on earth who can potentially also see that argument Mm -hmm. that there is a way of bringing harmony to society through fixing the monetary system, and this is a way that you could do it. That's not an argument that will appeal to everybody, and hence why I say that, hey, you could just do this on maths, just pure logic, Mm -hmm. and those people who don't believe in God and you know, that's the argument that you use, you use with them. I think both are powerful arguments. Have you noticed that, because I see this a lot in Bitcoiners around me, that, and some people have thanked me for this, which is strange because I'm not particularly religious, actually. I'm very interested in religion and mythology, and from a philosophical standpoint, I try to imitate Christ and Socrates as sort of my personal discipline that I like to try and follow, but I wouldn't describe myself as a Christian per se, but I see a lot of Bitcoiners rediscovering God or discovering God or turning to God or becoming religious. Do you see similar patterns among Bitcoiners? Yes, I do. And I suspect the reason is because because Bitcoin has this low time preference mindset where we defer gratification and we look after ourselves because we want to be better in the future. Um, look, I, I want to be, I want to be healthy and active into my old age, so I've got to look after my body, and I have to recognize that my body is a gift from God, and I need to look after it, my mind as well, and my spiritual health as well. And what I find with people who discover Bitcoin is that somehow they find a parallel with the inherent discipline of a monetary system that is deflationary and therefore low time preference. It's saving and investing for the future, not consuming today. And the kind of spirituality 
that religion gives you, mm-hmm. where you reflect in on yourself and you discipline your ego, your what's called your nafs in Arabic, and you develop patience or sabr in Arabic. These are all concepts in Islam that are very powerful, and they're taught to kids, you know, uh, immediately. Like you should, you should defer gratification. You should do good deeds for people. You know, you should uh, save and invest in the future. You should study hard now. You know, that will help you later. I think people who have that attitude in life tend to do well in life. They're successful people, more so than ones who have high time preference. And I think when people discover Bitcoin, it's, it reinforces that belief that I need to have low time preference and invest in my future, invest in my spiritual health, my mental health, my physical health. It's excellent. Horace, man, this has been a very enlightening conversation. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your wisdom with me today. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm on Twitter. That's Harris Irfan, my name. And um, I, uh, as I say, I'm the CEO of a company called Cordova Capital Markets. I'm occasionally on LinkedIn. So if it's business related, they can reach me on LinkedIn. If it's a uh, general chat on Bitcoin and Islamic finance, I'm on Twitter. Fantastic. We'll link to all that in the show notes. And thank you again. Fantastic. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Robert.